My name is Xavier Nones. I'm a senior at UNC Chapel Hill in the business school. Uh, and I'm also the co-president of the Minority Business Student Alliance. Today, we are hearing from Lowe's Company Incorporated CEO, Marvin Ellison, in a discussion regarding the imminent shift in attention to issues surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion that Lowe's and other companies have maintained in the midst of last summer's social unrest. Mr. Ellison will give a brief overview of the statement he released on behalf of Lowe's in May and dive deeper into the specific action that has been taken to combat racism and inequality. In addition, he will talk about his hands-on leadership approach and how it has impacted his relationship with employees and ultimate success of the Lowe's company. Time permitting, we'd also love to hear Mr. Ellison's perspective on the actions taken by other Fortune 500 company leaders. During the session, we will also set aside some time to answer any questions from the audience. So please use the Q&A function um, if you guys would like. Mr. Ellison, thank you for joining us. We know you have a very busy schedule being a, a CEO. Um, and we'd love to hear any opening remarks you may have before we start diving into some questions. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here. Hopefully y'all can hear me okay. Okay, great. Well, look, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Don't have a, a lot of opening comments other than to say, uh, I have just vivid memories of, of being a student as an undergrad uh, and uh, in business school. And I have a lot of respect for the journey uh, that each of you are currently on. Uh, I remember vividly having you know, access and opportunities to talk to executives and other visitors that would come in uh, and talk about life outside of college and talk about career opportunities and just a journey you know toward each individual person's vision of success uh, and and that was always very beneficial to me is one of the reasons why as busy as my schedule uh, will always be on a, a daily weekly basis I'll always try to find time to spend time with students you know, interested in, in learning uh, more about uh, my journey, more about my company, or just trying to build out those last couple of steps within their own future and personal journey. Uh, so with that, it's an honor to be here. Uh, just as a quick overview, I've been in retail uh, since my sophomore year uh, in college. I graduated from the University of Memphis uh, and started out working at Target, uh, making $4.35 an hour uh, as a part-time uh, employee. I know you all are thinking that was definitely below the poverty level, but I was a student just like many of you and I was working part time and full time trying to buy books, trying to keep the lights on uh, and try to just continue to financial, financially support myself through college. Uh, I spent 15 years at Target, uh, then I joined a company called the Home Depot, where I spent 12 years of my life. Uh, I had a chance to leave there and go be the uh, chairman and CEO of JC Penney in a, a really challenging turnaround situation that I learned a lot and worked with some very talented people. Uh, and since 2018, really the summer of 2018, uh, I've been the uh, president CEO of Lowe's. And, and just so you know, Lowe's has roughly 2,200 stores in the US and Canada. Uh, we did almost $90 billion uh, in sales revenue last year. And we have roughly 350,000 employees. So we're a big company. Uh, I think at last review, we're about the 32nd largest company in the U.S. Uh, based in Morrisville, North Carolina, just about 25 miles north of Charlotte. So with that, I'll pause and, and, and we can open it up for, for Q&A. For sure. Thank you for that uh, brief introduction. Uh, so the first question uh, sort of revolves around last summer and in, in the midst of social unrest. So in the midst of the racial unrest last summer, Lowe's released a statement, uh, and how has Lowe's been committed to the uplift of underrepresented minorities since then? And it may be best to give a brief overview of the statement uh, beforehand, just so that we're all on the same page with the audience. Um, but yeah, that's that's the first question. Well, look, I, I think it was it was less of a statement; it was more of a uh, more of a tweet, you know, from me, you know, relative to uh, my personal feelings as a black man. Uh, who spent most of my life growing up in the South uh, and and having you know, viewed what we all did 
on video, uh, you know, which started everything was, you know, the murder of George Floyd and then all the cascading events that occurred after that, you know, the, the message was more aligned around how uh, personally and as a company, you know, we would always fight against racism, discrimination, or any social injustice. I think the thing that we've tried to do as a company is we've tried to educate. You know, when, when people tried to get me to, to speak out in, in other public forums on the subject, I didn't do a lot of that last year because what I explained to everyone is I had really two groups uh, that I was responsible for that I wanted to spend the majority of my time speaking to and, and trying to make sure that I guided, led, and educated. And the first group was, was the 350,000 employees at Lowe's that we call associates. You know, I felt like as a CEO, it was my responsibility to make sure that we had the right pr training programs, we had the right cultural environment where, where people felt comfortable discussing things that were affecting them, whether it was things in the news, things operating in their lives, concerns about the company in general, specific to social justice, uh, for racial equality, uh, and just making sure that, that we were being sensitive to the unique needs that each individual has based on their ethnicity and their background. And so we had to do a lot of work at Lowe's to make sure that we put business resource groups in place to make sure that we had the proper training programs and also to make sure that people just felt comfortable having conversations. And we took it one step farther and I trained every leader in the company to go out and, and have a personal session with their direct reports. I called it creating a comfortable environment to have uncomfortable conversations. And one of the things that I did, you know, as one of now only three black CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, I took the lead to educate. I took the lead to educate my senior executives on things that had personally happened to me in my life, happened to my son, uh, to my brothers, so they can understand that some of these issues were not just isolated, you know, random events, but, but these are some systemic things that as a country and a culture that we're dealing with. The other group I spent time trying to influence is my two children. Uh, I got a 24 year old son and a 19 year old daughter. And, 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 and they, just like you all, they have to operate in this world in a much different world than I grew up in with social media and, and all the real time access to information. And, and so it's something that's obvious, obviously personal to me because of who I am and, and how I was raised and what I look like, but, but I also take the responsibility to try to inform and educate as much as I can so we can solve these issues. For sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing the answer to that question. That means a lot, especially hearing about your family and how that weighs into to that question. Uh, transitioning to the, the next question, according to Fortune, there are currently only four Black CEOs. Um, there's a Roz Brewer, uh, which is Walgreens Boot Alliance, Ken Frazier at Merck, yourself at Lowe's, and Renee Jones at M&T Bank. How do you think you were able to break that ceiling? And what kind of advice would you have for other people of color looking at best ways to advance into, um, into the business as an executive role? Yeah, thank you for that. And, uh, and Ken Frazier and Merck is getting ready to retire, so we're getting ready to go down to three. <laughs> so, ah. yeah, so, so we, we're still fighting the fight. So, look, here's, I mean, there is no simple easy answer, but here's what I'll, I'll say specifically. You know, I grew up in a, in a small town in Western Tennessee, about an hour outside of Memphis. Uh, it had 10,000 people, two stoplights, uh, and there was nothing sophisticated about it. Uh, I went to a high school that was rural and simple uh, and didn't prepare me to go to the University of Memphis, which at that time had 23,000 students from all over the world. Uh, I grew up the middle child of seven kids. My mom graduated from high school, worked in a factory most of my life. My dad never graduated from high school. Uh, and when I was born, they were sharecroppers and my dad became an insurance salesman and that lifted us from poverty to lower middle class. I never grew up with sponsors. I didn't grow up with mentors. I didn't grow up with a silver spoon. I didn't grow up with an Ivy League education. But what I had, I had parents around me that were supportive. 
that encouraged me. I had six siblings that were competitive and smart and had their own different ways and things they wanted to accomplish. Uh, and God gave me a desire in my heart to be greater than what I saw around me. And one of the many lessons my parents taught me is that you can't allow your surroundings to limit your vision around who and what you want to be. And so no matter what it looked like when I stepped out in my front yard and looked to the east, the west, the north, and the south, I didn't see anything that looked like success. You know, we didn't, we never bought a new car. Uh, our, we didn't have the nicest house. I didn't have the nicest clothes, but you know what? My parents reminded me often that we had it a lot better than most people. And, and, so, and so, so these are the foundational lessons that got me from that simple beginning to now being, you know, as you said, one of the current four black CEOs of, of Fortune 500 companies. Number one, my parents taught me, and these things are foundational then and they're foundational now, to have a strong belief in God because you have to have believe in something greater than yourself. And so my, my Christian belief grounds me on that and, and I and anyone's religious beliefs you know, is, is, is your own personal journey, but I just learned you have to believe in something greater than yourself because when the pressures of the world start to come down on you, you need to have some, some spiritual release you can go to to seek guidance beyond what you can do yourself. And I'm speaking specifically for me. The other thing that my parents taught me was the importance of operating with honesty and integrity. You're not gonna get ahead in life by being deceitful, or, or by trying to be underhanded. So be honest, be straightforward, and just be a good citizen. And the third thing was the importance of education. You know, they knew that they didn't have the opportunity the way they grew up to pursue formal education and to go out and to really pursue all that was available to them because they didn't have the funding and candidly, they didn't have the support structure around them. But they wanted to change that cycle for their children and, and, and me, and my sisters and brothers, we had opportunities that they didn't have. So I took all of those things and, and I went to work. And I went to work with that same mentality around strong faith in God, around being a good, honest person, but also you know, always having a mindset of continuous learning. So as I started in retail, the question is, well, well all those things sound great, Marvin. Still, how did you, how did you grow from, from an hourly position to the CEO? The thing that I learned early on, because I didn't have sponsors, I didn't have mentors, I didn't have, you know, a an Ivy League pedigree, I didn't have a silver spoon, I didn't have a country club membership. I went out and I took the most difficult opportunities that I could find to prove how good I was. So when I worked at Target, I took the toughest store assignments. When I worked at the Home Depot, I took the worst departments that had the worst results. That, that needed to be turned around because I wanted to take opportunities that other people would pass by because they had sponsorships and, and they had hookups so they could get better, better, you know, plum positions and better opportunities than I could because of the network they had. I just had to go do it the hard way and say, you know what, I'll take that job. I'll take that assignment because I had confidence that if I followed those same principles in life, I would be successful. And I've been very fortunate. I took those tough assignments. I was able to surround myself with, with talented, capable people. And, and, and in every one of those assignments, I was able to, to have success. Now, have I made mistakes? Yes, sir, I have, but I learned from all of them. And anytime you can learn from a mistake and not repeat it, then that mistake can, 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 can be beneficial to you. And, and so that is the Reader's Digest version of how I got here. And also I had a vision. You know, I would always sit back and plan my 12 year, my 12 month goals and my five year goals. And I did that coming out of college. And, and when I got to a point where my five year goals, you know, took me to certain senior executive level positions, I realized I need to go get my MBA because an undergrad wasn't enough. And, and so I went back and I got my MBA at 38 years old. Uh, and that was hard because I was married, had two kids. Uh, but but luckily my wife stuck with me. But but without making that part of my journey, I would have never had the ability to get to some of the positions that that I've had. So it's it's all of those things, but it's about you know being consistent along the way. Thank you for that. Uh, that's very inspirational for 
the audience, especially students like me, um, but also younger students, freshmen, uh, sophomores, juniors, to, to take those pieces of advice and use those to their advantage in the future. So we really appreciate you giving some insight from, a, from an executive, from a CEO. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question before we open up to the audience a little bit. Um, so this question, in your opinion, what are the best practices for consumers to weed out companies who have performative social impact campaigns versus real ones? Well, you know, I, I think the, the great opportunities that we have as consumers now is that you have access to so much information. So, you know, companies can proclaim a lot of things about who they are, what they stand for, but just at, at, at your fingertips, you can do a little bit of research and you can truly understand what a company stands for, what they stand for relative to social justice, what they stand for relative to diversity and inclusion, what they stand for relative to you know, environmental issues that are important to you. You know, you know back when I was in, in school like you all, it was really difficult to be able to go and do research to get your hands on the amount of information that you all can do a couple of keystrokes and get everything that you need. The, the thing that I'll, I'll say to you and to all the students watching is that when you graduate and you start to pursue career opportunities, I mean, there are a couple of things you want to look for. First and foremost, you want to look for a company that gives you the ability to grow. There's nothing better uh, than to have the ability to join a company and you can climb the corporate ladder within that company's environment. I, I know at, 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 at you all's age now, it's commonplace, you know, to, to change companies, you know, a lot more frequently than when I was your age. There's nothing wrong with that if you're pursuing your career pursuits, but, but, but I'm still here to tell you that as you build your reputation within a company, it's a lot easier to grow within an existing company than it is to change companies and, and have to reestablish yourself over and over again. So as you're looking for opportunities outside of college, whatever your major or your career endeavors may be, try to find a company that gives you multiple opportunities to grow in multiple departments and functions in the company. But the other thing that's even more important is make sure the company uh, supports your values. If you're someone and, and you're really passionate about diversity and inclusion and having a cultural environment that's inclusive and, and that's going to support someone that looks like you, the easiest way to determine a company's commitment to that is go online and look at their executive leadership team. Because I'm here to tell you, if a company is really committed to diversity and inclusion, you're going to see it in the in the the ethnic and the gender makeup of their senior leadership team. If that senior leadership team doesn't reflect what, what's passionate about you, then more than likely it's going to be hard for that company to prove that these things matter. Because as the old saying goes, change always starts at the top. And, and so if you don't see it at the top, more than likely it's not going to exist throughout the organization. But, but because of the access to information, there's a lot of ways that, that, that you can determine if companies are truly standing for the things that they say they are. Got it. Thank you for that insight. Uh, we appreciate that. We want to open it up for some questions from the audience with the last 14 or 15 minutes. Uh, we have a few questions coming in. The first question is, what about Lowe's stood out to you and made you want to work there? Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. It, it just, just think about what I said about how I started out. You know, right. started out the middle child of seven, you know, mm -hmm. and, and parents that, you know, had had really never had an opportunity to to really be the individuals that they dreamed of being. And, and, and so now I have a chance to to come and be the president and CEO of the at the time, the 40th largest company, you know, in America, you know, and, and at the time, the company was having this share of struggles. But remember what I said, I've, I've made my whole career journey about taking assignments that were tough, you know, taking on responsibilities that most people, and a lot of people covered it, you know, this role because of the size of the company and the opportunity. But it was, it was, it was that, it was the ability to provide leadership over 300,000 employees. And more importantly, 
it was the ability to make a difference. Because the thing I know about home improvement is one of the greatest accomplishments that people will have in their lifetime is when they purchase their first home. Uh, it, it, it is going to be the most expensive uh, investment that you make. And it's also going to be one that you're going to have the most pride in. And so Lowe's is a home improvement company. And what we do every day is we help people maintain, you know, the value and maintain the beauty and reimagine their home. And so it's, it's, a, it's a great business because people have scraped and scrapped for years to try to get that down payment and to try to get that first home or to get that second home. And, and our business, you know, is all about supporting, you know, that dream becoming a reality. And, and so for me, it was just too good to pass up. For sure. Thank you. Thank you for that insight as well. Uh, our next question, uh, someone asked, as someone who started from an hourly position, how does that experience help you connect with employees now? Which I think is a pretty good question. It's a, it is a great question. Uh, and it's something I talk about all the time. You know, when I was that hourly employee, I would come to work and I would clock in and I would next to the time clock was a organizational chart of all the leaders of the company, the CEO and all of the executive leaders, all the important people. And there were photos. And I would look at that thing every day and I would just say, man, I don't know anything about these guys. Cause at the time it was just, it was a chart of, 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 of white guys, you know? And, and I just said, I don't know anything about these guys. They don't know anything about me. And I just felt so disconnected. And I would say to myself, man, if I'm ever blessed and fortunate enough to get into an executive position, I'm going to try to find ways to connect, you know, with those employees out there working on the front lines. And what I do now, fast forward, is every single week, including today, I do a weekly update. Uh, I do a video uh, to all the employees of the company. It, it, it lasts between five to 10 minutes. We share it through our, you know, internal intranet website within the company and, and I just talk to the I talk to the employees I talk to them about what's in the news that's relevant I talk to them about events within the company I talk to them about places I've been you know employees I've met success stories around the company and and we send this out to all the, the stores in the US Canada all of our you know associates in our buying offices in China and we have an uh, information technology office set up in Bangalore, India. And on a weekly basis, I send this out. I share my email address with all the employees of the company. Over 300,000 folks. I get emails every day from, you know, associates and employees around the, around the company, around the world with questions, concerns. And, and I do town halls almost on a weekly basis where I'm answering questions just like this. Uh, with employees out there on the front line. So none of those things would matter to me if I didn't live my life starting out as an hourly employee, understanding how disconnected you can feel and how underappreciated you can feel in one of those jobs. And, and so being an hourly employee, man, it's, it's been really important to me. And also seeing my parents be hourly employees and, and understanding how they would come home some days feeling so dejected and feeling so disrespected. Uh, and feeling as though no one cared. All of those things have helped to shape how I communicate and, and how I try to engage with, with all levels of the organization. For sure. And I think what makes a great leader is finding new ways to connect with you know, employees or, or people under you or people above you. So I commend you for finding new ways and, and mediums to do that. And that's, um, that's a very great thing to hear. Excellent. Our next question, uh, is what advice would you give underrepresented minorities that seem to be taking the right actions, following the same values you have in the corporate world, whether that's working hard, networking, being, being a good corporate citizen, et cetera, but can't seem to get to the next level in management? Look, you, you have to be resilient. And, and I know that sounds like you know, a cliche, but let me, let me give you some specifics. So when people look at my career and they read my resume, man, it looks like a success story. It looks like, man, this guy has had no, no setbacks, no disappointments in his career. It looks like something, you know, carved out, you know, of a, of a novel. 
uh, that's the farthest thing from the truth. Because what, what, what my resume and my bio does not tell you is that I can count at least 10 times in my career that I got passed over for a promotion that I believed I deserved. Uh, and every one of those times, it was devastating. You know, it was for a lot of reasons. You know, it was because the supervisor uh, or the hiring manager uh, didn't think that I was smart enough or because the hiring manager had a better relationship with someone else or a bunch of random, you know, kind of anecdotes like that. And in every time that happened and I was devastated by the rejection, I had two choices. I could put my head down, feel sorry for myself, or I could get up off the floor, dust myself off and keep pushing. And in every opportunity, I obviously got up I dusted myself off and I kept pushing because I was not going to be defined by some limited person in, in their hiring decision. I just, I felt like I could make this work. And in those situations, rather than again, feeling sorry for myself or pointing blame, I just sat back and figured out what's my next step. I never put my career in the hands of human resources. I never put my career in the hands of my supervisor. I never put my, hand, my career in the hands of anyone. I controlled my own career. I sat down you know, with my wife and, and with people I trusted and would just talk about where I am, where I want to go. And then I would figure out the best pathway to get there. So the short answer to your question is be resilient. The next thing is don't feel sorry for yourself. Number, and number three, just keep pushing and take control of your career because you're gonna have setbacks. It is part of life. It's part of a career journey. But the only time those setbacks will win is if you give up and you stop pushing. Because if you truly have talent and you have leadership and you are delivering results, somebody is going to identify that if you get get up every day and you keep pushing hard. For sure. And I think the entire audience really appreciates that message. Uh, very inspirational and motivating for um, especially younger students, but also people who are professionals right now um, looking to get promoted, but, you know, feel like, you know, there's something in the way, there's a roadblock they face. It's always important to stay resilient. Uh, I think we can squeeze in one last question from the audience real quick. Uh, so there's a question that came in. I read that, he said, I read that last year that Lowe's partnered with Damon John to support minority small businesses through a virtual pitch program. Uh, and he essentially just wants to know how did that work out? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. It, it worked out incredibly well. You know, we were going back and forth on ways that we could attract more diverse vendors and diverse suppliers. And we decided, let's try something different. So we reached out to Damon Johns, and you, and you all know he's one of the hosts on ABC's Shark Tank. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and Damon worked with us to create our own version of Shark Tank, we call making it with Lowe's. And we went out and, and we basically communicated that we were looking for entrepreneurs and suppliers that had ideas or products that we could possibly sell at Lowe's. I mean, we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applicants. As a matter of fact, I think we had over a thousand applicants. We narrowed it down, you know, and I think ultimately we have give or take 200 vendors that we found that we're gonna start selling their products on Lowe's.com, which, which to me is an incredibly successful you know, event. But we narrowed it down uh, to like the top 10, trying to find you know, four vendors that had such significant product ideas that we would you know, give them prominent placement on our shelves and our stores or on, online, and, and, we, and we ultimately narrowed it down to four, and, and we're gonna be having that product on the shelf uh, this year with one grand prize winner that we you know, gave, you know, the last four, we gave them mentorship, we gave them grants, we gave them marketing support, we gave them, you know, uh, direct access to some of our merchants and product development people just to help them understand how they can get their product going. So it was it was a great process. We had so much fun. We're going to do it again this year. Uh, and, and I got a feeling this year it'd be even bigger and better because people will see the success from last year and we'll have a lot more people 
who will be participating. So thanks for the question. And, and look, you know, it's important to me that our suppliers, that our leaders uh, and, and our board of directors reflect the communities that we operate in from a gender and an ethnicity standpoint. I mean, that, that is my commitment because when you can surround yourself with individuals that are different from you from a gender ethnicity standpoint and that have a representation of your consumers, then you make better decisions as a company and as a leader. And that's something that we'll be continually committed to at Lowe's. That's great to hear. I'm, I'm quite the avid Shark Tank watcher myself. So that, that's, that's great to hear. Um, and I'm sure we have a bunch of student entrepreneurs on this on, uh, on this call and this webinar as well. So and they're looking out for that potential pitch competition or whatever um, that's really titled. Um, that might be a great opportunity for some Kena Flaga students and North Carolina Central University students to be seen and, sh and showcase their wonderful creative ideas. But that's about all. Um, Mr. Ellison, thank you so much for taking some time out of your super busy schedule being the CEO of Lowe's.